All right. Well, welcome and good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? One thing I know is it's hot in here, but not as hot as it could be, because it could be a lot hotter if you're standing outside right now. Thank you, Lord, for air conditioning. Amen? If you need to stick around and talk to people today because you don't have AC in your house, feel welcome to stay. We'll turn it down until the thing breaks. So uh, we love that God is doing something in this place. How many enjoyed that we had a couple of female singers today? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Offered one uh, worship team meeting and we fed them and... Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that had interest, so I'm so blessed that we can join together in worship of our King, and uh, so just a couple of things. If you're new with us here today, I just want to thank you for being here. You will find a card in the back that if you want to put some of your information in there, you can join us on Facebook in our newsletter. It is a private group, and uh, but we would love to connect with you, let you know what we're doing, and keep you uh, involved with uh, communication so that you don't miss out on anything. A couple things that we're going to be doing uh, is in August that I'm still working on is a date for baptism. So if you have interest in being baptized, we've had a few people uh, share that. And uh, we're going to either do it here or uh, to those that are going to be welcome at our house. Because our house is what it is and we have a pool in the backyard, it works. But if everybody showed up, I think my neighbors would get a little upset. So... We would love those that are connected with you. If you want to get baptized, we'll uh, invite those to come, and, and we'll do a couple baptisms probably through the month of August. Another thing is we'll do hot August nights. We're going to do a movie out there on the lawn there, uh, so in the evening, so I'm going to be preparing that. But I'm very excited for what God is doing as we just grow as a family together. Amen? Amen. So here's our prophecy journal. This is what I talked about last week and what we as a, a body of elders kind of agreed on. In the front, you'll find nine questions that have been asked that I felt uh, the Lord gave scripture to understanding because we want to hear the voice of the Lord in our lives and to edify the body, amen? One thing that we want to do, though, is not overlook the value of his word. A word was given today. How many remember what it was? Yeah, we're going to write it down so that people can be encouraged by this and grow in this, so that we can weigh it uh, through the word of God and as elders, and that people will grow in what we are to do, what? Earnestly seek the gifts that God has designed for you and for me. Earnestly seeking them doesn't mean that you will always receive them, but as you earnestly seek, I promise that the gift of his love will be present in you. Amen? So it is my privilege to honor my brother once again, who has come in to preach because that's what he does. He preaches. I teach. He preaches. And so would you welcome Brian as he comes up and shares the word today for us. All right. Praise God. So that's on. Yep. Um, I, I think uh, preach is P-R and then E-A-C-H. So it's all right if we do a little bit of both at the same time, right? Yes. We'll teach. Preach, teach, teaching, preaching. Yes. All right. Whew, thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us, your people, all the time. You said in your word, you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. So it's not just on a Sunday morning when your people are gathered together that we experience your presence, Lord, but you're, you're constantly with us to help us. And do you all mind if you just lift your hands up? Thank you, Father, that you prepared hearts for what you're, you're doing, not just what you're going to do, but what you're already doing here today. Thank you, Father, for healing. Oh, you're so, you, so, you love your people so much. You just call and you call us to come to you, to trust you. Father, thank you for grace that our, that our ears would be open, our eyes would be open, that we'd be able to hear, Lord, and we'd be able to receive your word and be healed by you be changed by you, by, be transformed by the work of your Holy Spirit. So we just thank you for loosing your Holy Spirit. Even as we hear your word today, Father, I pray you'd pour out your Holy Spirit like when Peter spoke in Cornelius' home and he preached the gospel and your Holy Spirit fell even as the word of God was shared. Father, we, we put away our thoughts that things have to happen certain ways. You can do what you want, when you want, however you want, because we desire you. Yes. You're the one who's worthy. As your people, we need you. We need your grace. So thank you, Father, for being so faithful to give yourself to us when we ask. 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so everybody can go home now. Uh oh, yay, yay. Somebody says, yay. <laughs> Trust me, I mean, if there's, if there's air conditioning, you might want to stay put for a little longer, just saying. Uh, whew. Well, the preacher's already undone, so uh, we'll trust the Lord will give grace to help the preacher come through. Um, so the Lord gave me a, a, a nice light word to bring to you today. Stop sinning, climb higher. Yeah, so, and I was like, I was like, uh, as I was preparing, I was like, Lord, I... Uh, Hmm, that just seems, yeah. And, uh, and I just kept saying, are you sure? And I just kept feeling the Holy Spirit saying, move forward. So I, I was up on the, the, the sofa in our upstairs family room this morning because there's air conditioning up there early this morning. And my youngest son was sleeping on the other part of the sofa because there's air conditioning in that room. And uh, as I was coming to the conclusion of the preparation of this message, praying, he thought I was choking because I was actually getting choked up over the grace that God was revealing to me. Wow. So, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And we'll try not to, I'm told that I talk really fast, so I'll, I'll try not to go too fast. I try to be respectful and mindful of time. God doesn't need a two and a half hour sermon to work. He can do it in 30 seconds or a second. He could have already done it if we've received it. But I will share what the Lord put on my heart. First Peter 4, 1 through 5. So the first exhortation is going to be stop sinning. It's real simple, real simple message. Uh, Therefore, for this reason, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh, this is interesting, has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. How many of y'all would like to be free? Right? How many of y'all want Jesus Christ to set us free to live this way? For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. I had to pause on that when I was chewing on that because I just thought that was really interesting that abominable, abominable idolatries is at the end of that list. Sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties. It sounds like it's a big party, right? But then right at the end of that list with the word abomination in front of it, is idolatries. So God sees this as just as much, if not more, a problem in regards to our hearts. And y'all, y'all know idolatry is giving our hearts to something more than Jesus, more than, more than our creator. Nobody here ever does that. Yeah, see, it's quiet when sermons like this are preached. I know. My own heart's quieted, all right? In all this, they are surprised. The world is surprised. You do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. I mean, when we talk about sin and turning from sin, we always have to bring the full gospel, which part of the full gospel, friends and brothers and sisters, is that there is a day of judgment that is coming. There's a day of judgment. I'm thankful for it, okay? Because I think by the end of this message, we'll understand we can be on the right side of that thing through the mercy of God. But I'm also thankful for the judgment that God's bringing because he's gonna bring an end to sin. I don't wanna be done with it, 100%. Yeah, amen. I think as as we draw, anybody in here while we're worshiping thinking, I just wanna be in sin right now. No, no. When, When we finally get our hearts engaged, you know, and we're in the Holy Spirit. Where do we want to be? We want to be nowhere but with Jesus and just filled up with his life because that's where life is. And then, and then we go off and we live and we shouldn't go off. We should stay in the spirit, but we go off, we live and all this stuff's around us and we lose focus and God's merciful. I was uh, reading from the book of Revelation. See, I'm already going on a rabbit trail. Um, 
with my family at dinner. It's a little light reading for dinner. We just go through the Bible together, right? We're going through for the second time. And, and John, uh, the revelator, John the apostle, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I stopped and crickets chirped. And no one noticed. And maybe like 15 seconds passed by, maybe 30, maybe it was an hour. I don't know, it felt like a long time. And then my 12-year-old son says, what is in the spirit on the Lord's day? I said, Thank you very much for asking that question. It's amazing. We just blow on by instead of stopping. Like, what is, what is that that he's experiencing that we should be experiencing? That, yeah. So, arm yourselves with the same purpose. So, let this attitude, let this be your attitude or way of thinking. What, what attitude? Uh, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin the attitude is one, like Jesus Christ, I'm willing to be persecuted for doing what is right. And I'm gonna say something, there's gonna be things I say that I believe will feel condemning, but I'm gonna just trust the grace of God's gonna be here for everybody, because truth is truth. Uh, I also um, chatted with one of my boys today, and I, I said, hey, remember the thing I said yesterday? It, it could seem really hard and condemning, I said, I, I feel like the Lord tells me as I'm praying this morning, I need to come to you and say, it is the truth. It is the truth, and it's not for the sake of condemnation. Because you are what God intends for you to be as you're looking to Jesus, but God also wants you to become what he intends for you to be by letting his work happen in your life. Yes. So we have, to, we have to, you know, God's a good father. We have to hear the truth, even if it's hard. So I would desire that as God's church me personally, that I could be persecuted because my life, my life is so right in regards to living the way Christ has called me that the world looks and they say, disgusting. I love for it because they would see Jesus so much. Y'all know that we're supposed to fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. And so there's something that happens. It's not something we have to bring upon ourselves, but Jesus shows up in our life so much because the world looks and they say, we don't want anything to do with what's in you. Now, I've got, I've got news for them. The Spirit of God calls and chases them and draws them and convicts their hearts. So there may be a day where they flip, but until they do, I want Jesus. And I don't want so much of Jesus that you all understand that your Savior was murdered by the world. The light of the world came, the darkness hated the light. And so the light should be so, so full in our lives. Jesus should be so full in our lives, the world looks and says, what is the matter with you people? Why are you so different than we are? And they malign us. So this is part of the suffering that uh, we look at here in regards to turning away from sin, turning away from living for self. Um, the second part of it, so this is suffering, being willing to suffer for the sake of walking in the righteousness of God. The second part is choosing not to live for my desires. You know there's, there's suffering in that? That when I woke up today, I had skin on. I'm sure you're all thankful for that. Okay, I mean, I'm a, a man who has the spirit of God living in me, which is amazing, but I'm also a man who has flesh. And as long as I live in this body, there's a part of me that I would like to throw off, be, be, be rid of. But there is going to be until Jesus Christ comes for me and I'm glorified with Jesus Christ. He transforms me. There's going to be a wrestling. And so there will be a suffering. If I say, I will belong to Jesus Christ. I will not live for myself. I'll not live for my desires because they're there. The flesh is constant. Y'all know we sin, right? We still sin. That's not in my notes, I don't think, but maybe it is. Yeah, 1 John. He says, if anybody says they don't sin, they're a liar. So we all struggle with sin. Even, even after God, and I think sometimes one of the things I want to say is some people get to a spot where they're choosing sin and choosing sin and choosing sin, and they begin, because they're struggling to put self to death, that is in the notes later, but they begin to doubt God. They begin to doubt the power of God. They begin to doubt the grace of God. They begin to walk down a path of condemnation, and sometimes they just throw off the grace and mercy in God and say, God didn't do it. God didn't do it for me. He can't help me. Yes, he can. There's a wrestling. 
That's an intense wrestling. So choosing, suffering in regards to choosing not to live for my desires, but giving myself to God's purpose, first to live for the will of God. First to live for the will of God all the time. Did it cost Jesus something? The author and perfecter of our faith? Did, how often did he live for the will of God? Audience participation is allowed. Always. 100% of the time. I mean, that's, I was talking to one of my clients that doesn't know the Lord. I'm like, if that's not proof, because she, she says to me, she says to me, Jesus sinned. I said, no, no, he did not. I said, this is, I mean, there's raises the dead, you know, cast out demons, heals the sick, miracles. But one of the things that's amazing to me, the resurrection, uh, his own resurrection after the cross. But one of the things that's so amazing to me and proof of his deity is he never once sinned. When he lived in skin. Wow. Man, to receive more grace and to walk in more holiness. There's a reason. There's a reason this message is being preached. It's not just to, you know, oh, and God says, go be hard on him, you know. Uh, he's always wanting to give encouragement to you. All right. Um, so, uh, interesting. Um, you guys got to be careful because when I have good Greek study materials, it makes it too easy, you know, to dig on Greek. Um, it's interesting to me. Excesses of dissipation. Where is that? It says that in there. Um, yeah, excesses of dissipation in verse 4. Uh, Anakousis uh, and uh, asotia. An extremely high point on a scale of extent and implying an excess of something with negative value. Behavior which shows lack of concern or thought for the consequences of an action. Huh. high point on a scale of extent implying an excess of something with negative values. Interesting. Why would we choose that? Why would we choose an excess of things that have negative value? And nobody ever does that. I mean, I think of uh, Paul the Apostle saying, all things are permissible, not all things are beneficial. So here's the deal. Why? Why not choose what is most beneficial? I, we struggle with this, right? I mean, and, and I got to speak to this present culture, especially young people, maybe old people. There are old people who play a lot of video games these days. You know, it's like not just the, the young adult that's living in mom and dad's basement. It's grandma or grandpa now. It's like, yeah, my, my grandpa's down there and he won't let me play on my PlayStation 5 for crying out loud. Um, I've even seen grandparents who won't pick up their nose from a phone and look at their grandkids and speak life into them. Is it possible? Is it possible you can go 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of age and instead of moving on in Christ and being filled up with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, we miss the opportunity to pour out what God would want to put into our lives to other people? Is it possible? I think the thing is when we don't, give consideration to God's call for us to constantly be living in repentance, we just assume, we just assume that we're going to arrive at God's intended destination for us. That's our choice all the way to the end. I don't know if people believe that because I didn't get a big hearty amen on that, but that is our choice all the way to the end. Yeah, man. I mean, I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss the grace that God would give to me and the grace that he'd pour out through my life. Why? Not for my sake, but because I want to see Jesus Christ glorified. I want to know Christ. Is it worth suffering for this? By the way, the guy preaching is not perfect. I'm amazed, you know, as we're worshiping, as we're praising. Um, I'm a wretched man. I'm a wretched man. I know it. We are here because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It is amazing to me that God calls any man with skin on to stand and preach if their name's not Jesus. And the good, the good that is accomplished in me is most definitely God. It is not me. Now, there is a word when we're praying about a flaming sword. Yeah, that's the word of God. It's not Brian that we need. It's the word of God. 
It's not Chris that we need. Well, cry it out loud. It's not Chris we need. <laughs> I got a pretty hearty amen on that one. <laughs> I better get going because there's six pages. So uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. We're, this is just going to be a lot of scripture. Is that all right if we just share the word of God? Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Therefore, again, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. I better slow down. I'm told I go fast. If you don't catch up, too bad. Sorry. It'll be recorded. So, I mean, seriously, I, I really encourage people. Uh, I think that the Lord gives us a good meal to eat. And it's like uh, when you go to a fancy restaurant, they keep bringing out, you know, another course, another course. All right. So, you, you, maybe, you maybe shouldn't eat it all in one setting. Maybe you should chew on it, think about it, you know, take some home in a doggy bag. I don't know why they say doggy because I don't have dogs. Um, but the little, you know, take go home bag, you know, and have some more of that. Like the Chipotle burrito I had yesterday. I only ate so much of it, and I had some for breakfast this morning. So, <laughs> Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that's talking about people who weren't perfect, but they actually made a choice to live for Christ. And that's Hebrews 11. You can read that and check it out. Let us also, let us also, let us also, because we have to make the choice now. We have to make the choice. No more flannel graph stories. This is the time we live in. But this generation, you're breathing, you're sucking air. And God's calling us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So I like the honesty of the word of God because God says, y'all are weak. That's what he says in his word. Y'all are weak. The sin that so easily en ensnares us. Easily. So I, you know, I bet people walk around, not me. I'm like, oh, buddy, you're going to trip and fall flat on the ground right there. Everybody, weak compared to Jesus. I think part of the growing up uh, in Christ happens more when we finally come to recognize more our weakness I mean, it's not what we want preached. You know, we want greasy grace and, you know, pat everybody on the back and you're awesome, you're awesome possums. And I'm just thinking, I mean, I'm a stinky possum and uh, Jesus is awesome, okay? Uh, nobody's singing praise songs to me. Just, at, I mean, like if you see my wife singing praise songs to me, that would be weird, okay? But that doesn't happen. The people that live, live with me, they don't sing praise songs to me. They're like, no, 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 no. We praise Jesus. And we had the grace to live with that guy this week. So, <laughs> fixing our eyes on Jesus. Oh, for, every, if for every time the word says turn away from something, it always says turn this direction, right? So, where do you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of, of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross? So, he did all these things I'm going to preach about today, despising the same shame. Um, and he, as he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners. See, I want, that's why I say, y'all think I'm weird. That's why I say I'd like to see more opposition to my faith because that means Christ is showing up more in my life and not just me, but the church. It's something that is missing a little bit in the American church. And I, I will say, um, to people who say, Preach the gospel if necessary. Use words. That's false doctrine. I don't see. There's not stones flying, so I guess we're all right. But I'm just going to say it. None of, this, none of this monkey business evangelism that's been going on for years. I mean, sure, Christ should be in our life so much that people can see and hear him in our day-to-day -day life. And I think that's one of the things the church needs to get back to is just living in Christ so he's just living through us. But guess what? He's, he uses the foolishness of preaching. He's got a fool standing in front of you today doing it. And it's not just through the preacher on a Sunday or on a Wednesday. It's through our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. How can they believe if they have not heard? At some point in time, there has to be enough love that it leads to courage that we open our mouth and say, Jesus is your answer. You can turn from your sin because he's already paid the price for it. I mean, what a terrible thing to have to share with people. <clears throat> it's, good, it's good news. That's why it's called the gospel. 
Okay, so. So consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself so you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. So there's the word of God for you. How much should we be striving against sin in ourselves? This wrestle match. How much? To the point of shedding blood. So you've not yet resisted. Uh, specifically, you've not yet opposed sin in yourself. To the point of being put to death by the world, like Jesus, or choosing to put yourself to death. Not physically. I want to make sure we're clear on that. Okay? It's the dying to self. Like Peter was saying, it's the choice. I will suffer because I don't want to live. I want, I want Christ to live through me. And you know what happens? That's where we really live. That's where we really live. I mean, here's one of the challenges. Pay attention to this and let your heart be challenged by this. You only think about young people and stuff and uh, people in the world and how many of them... How many of these people can say, I know somebody who Jesus is alive in them. I know God's alive in that person. I know God's alive because I met somebody that God is alive in that person. I know that person is like in Antioch, that person is a Christian. They're like a little Christ. God is alive in that person. Where is that? Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. In the American gospel, we've said, hey, we're, we're good, you know, there's all this grace, so let's just, you know, we're cool, let's just float, let's just float, let's not, let's not suffer for the sake of Christ. <laughs> Suffering because of persecution, anybody in here afraid to be persecuted for righteousness sake? Eh, eh, okay, all right, cool. Yeah, I just want to let you know, I'm not like, woohoo, let's go, you know. I just know there's, there's a, a grace a greater grace that is experienced when we're, we're walking with Christ and that opposition comes. There's growth into stronger faith. There's a deeper fellowship that's experienced with God, a fellowship we experienced a little bit now, but I think the Lord would call us deeper. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So, yeah, making a choice, putting myself to death. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Jesus says, it's Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Verse 19. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So yes, y'all know God has imputed or he's given you his righteousness through what Jesus did. He says, you are my righteousness, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did. Y'all realize that Jesus Christ is, your, is holiness for you. He has made you holy. God sees you as perfect in his eyes. But you all know, just like my young guy that I was talking to today, he also calls us to look at, in reality, am I walking in holiness? Am I walking in righteousness? Thank God I can stand in the presence of God and receive grace because of the blood of Jesus. But there is a call to actually walk in the presence of God and experience genuine transformation so that as God's people, we find strength in our weakness to walk in righteousness and walk in holiness. And if anybody would stand and preach a, gr a grace message that is anything less than obey all the word of God, they are, that is false doctrine. Jesus says they'll be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And I'm like, wait, the least will they get in? Uh, but no, he clears that up. Whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So he, so he says, he says, strive. Pursue holiness. And, and it's all through the word of God. Pursue righteousness. And I really think that we have come to a place where our culture is, I mean, I mean, this isn't in the notes either, but the, the spirit of lawlessness is being revealed, okay? This is how we know we're getting closer to the end. 
because the, the, the revealing of the man of lawlessness is going to happen. That's the Antichrist, but the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. How do you know that we're getting closer to the return of Christ? Because lawlessness comes out of the closet to the point, finally, where it doesn't feel like it has to hide anymore. And when we as the church simmer in that culture, we begin to think it's okay in some ways to compromise because the blood of Jesus it, you know, I'm, for, I'm forgiven, there's mercy. And man, I struggle, but I'm forgiven, there's mercy. No, put yourself to death. Struggle and wrestle and grind it out in Jesus. It's not works. It's not works. But the point is, it's okay to suffer. Yeah. It's what God's called us to. It's discipline. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, people are willing to be disciplined about a whole bunch of other things. They'll work so hard to get an award, the accolades of men. I, I've worked in places where everybody's trying to get, you know, the award. I was talking to my family about this. I talk a lot, by the way. I was talking to my family about this last night. I'm like, there they are. You know, they want to get the award for being the best salesperson or whatever. And like behind the scenes, you know, they all hate each other's guts. It's so weird. <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know I, just, I hate that person, you know. And you're like, what? And, and, and it's whatever it takes, you know, to have whatever. And then, and then you have people. Yeah, so at any rate. Um, <laughs> It's how crazy the world is. And we simmer and we soak in this stuff and we, get, we begin to think like them instead of like Jesus. This call to holiness. You're like, oh, that's so hard. Yes, yes, it's impossible. Oh, that's gonna be a struggle. Yes. Do you realize that the struggle is worth it? Do you understand the hope that you have in Jesus Christ? Do you, do you understand? Do you realize that in that struggle, in that, that yielding, in that willingness to say, I will give my life. I don't have to be the apostle Peter or the apostle John to do it. I can be Brian Pettit and I can give my life to Jesus because in this time, I want my life to be his. I want his Holy Spirit to fill my life. I want the word of God to come from my life. I want Jesus to be glorified. He has to be glorified. In this generation, he has to be glorified. You are the church. You're the ones God's called to this. We are the ones God's called to this. Don't love this world. That's not in my notes either. The love of the world, if it's in you, the love of the Father's not in you. First John. We can't, we can't allow ourselves to be deceived and to compromise. The one we serve is most worthy. The one we serve went through all of this for us, ahead of us. He gave up more than he's ever called us to give for him. Such perfect love. Such perfect love. How is it we are so easily blinded from seeing how awesome and amazing his love and grace extended towards us is? We'd find ourselves groveling at the feet of the world to try to win their acceptance, fearful of what they think of us. Instead of thinking about Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's given for us. Seriously, this is what we're doing. And we wonder why are we not full of the Holy Spirit? Oh man, he says in his word, Jesus said, I, my father wants to give my, the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks. He wants to give him. But he is the Holy Spirit. And there's gotta be a place where we make room for him. I know this, any compromise in me. Yes, the blood of Jesus covers my sins, but any compromise in me is a place that I've not made a room for him. There was that widow, you know, she made a room for Elijah. And then when her son died, he ended up resurrected. So the power of the Holy Spirit, good thing she made that room. Huh. You know, where's the power of God? Where's the grace of God? Did you make a room? Did you make a room? Like every room? I don't even want furniture. If furniture gets in his way, I'll sleep on the floor, on the carpet, man. More room for the Holy Spirit. Is that all right? It's cool. Get rid of the dining room table. We can recline like Eastern culture again, you know? Get rid of it. It's taking up room. We want Jesus. Room for Jesus. Room for the Holy Spirit. So, so whoever would teach you that uh, you don't need to obey all the word of God, eh, they're a liar. Whoever would teach others they're loosed from obeying God's commandments. So Jesus gives this most difficult exhortation. He does more than once in his ministry. Go and sin no more. Like he, he ministers and we look at the grace, the, the woman that you know, was caught in adultery and 
They drag her in front of everybody, and they hey, he was without sin, cast the first stone. Good thing she was brought in front of Jesus because she ends up alive. You know, woman, where are your accusers? Uh, they're gone. Well, neither do I accuse you. And okay, cool. But then he says, you're going to sin no more. What? He says that to you and to me. You realize that's really hard? That's not easy. So he doesn't say, okay, you found grace and mercy, so now you're off the hook. He says, go and sin no more. Man, we need, we need him. I think we need fellowship. We need help from each other. We need encouragement of the Holy Spirit. We really need, yeah, we need the Lord to help us through this. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5, in regards to our present culture, realize this in the last days, difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, uh, irreconcilable, livable, oof. malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Uh, shouldn't be us, right? Holding, and I see, and, that, and these, are always, these are always written to pastors of churches, like here, this is Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, written to a pastor of a church. So this isn't a message that's going out to the world. It's a message that Paul's sending to Timothy to communicate with the church. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. That's a tough thing. You know what the problem is, being a preacher, is you don't know what the hearts of all the people are that are sitting in front of you. I mean, there's times I need God to help me know what is in my own heart. God knows, though. And one of the biggest things that's a big concern to me as I've preached for a lot of years is sitting in churches and leading and overseeing and knowing there's people that sit there that are not going to heaven. And that part I realized the other day, that part where people stand before the throne of God and they say, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. And they tell him all the things they did. I did this and I did that in your name. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You know where they're standing? At the great white throne judgment seat of Christ. You think about that. Terrifying. All the way to that finish line thinking they were okay why because they never put their trust in jesus it's possible so i mean like with the people that i'm ministering to you know i had somebody come to me that's been years in the church and they they're like i don't know if i'm going to heaven well i'm not going to back off of that i'm not going to say you're okay you're okay you've, you've been in church all your life that doesn't matter have they truly trusted in jesus christ have they truly turned? It's awesome people are going to be baptized because we were supposed to preach, repent, turn from your sin, turn to Jesus Christ for mercy and be baptized. Get up into that water and let your old life be buried there and be raised up into new life. Something supernatural happens when you trust in Jesus. He gives you a new heart. I mean, there's some people that could sit and they could say this message doesn't pertain to me because I have no desire to do anything right. It's possible. I mean, until the Spirit of God's working, that we, we live in sin like, like the Gentiles, like unbelievers, and we're like, hey, it's cool, just live however we want. I'm not worried about it. But then something beautiful happens, the Holy Spirit begins to pursue the heart. And so that person maybe has sat for years and years and years in this place or some church somewhere or heard the Word of God a whole bunch of times, and you've been fine, you felt like you're fine. And you felt like you're fine, but then all of a sudden your, your heart, just like my 70-year-old friend, starts to get stirred up, turned, begin to become concerned about the condition of your soul. Where will I stand when I stand before the throne of God? The conviction of judgment is there. You begin to realize judgment is a reality. The whole world would tell you it's not. You can go listen to the atheist. It's the weirdest thing. People listen to people who say they don't know God so they can tell them what they know about God. Um, no, I'd listen to the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. And, and maybe that's you today. And you, some of you think, this is the close of the message. It's not. But maybe that's you today. <laughs> the Spirit of God brings conviction. He convinces you of what is right. He convinces, of you, he convinces you of the sin in your life. He convinces you of judgment. And why is he doing that? Because of love. Because what he's doing is he's calling you to see what Jesus has done, what God has done for you through Jesus. You are forgiven. If you would look, if you look to Jesus, if you'd receive God's mercy, if you do it, all your sin is forgiven at that cross. And you know what? When I see Jesus, you'd understand this when the Holy Spirit's working your heart. You don't want to live in sin anymore. You don't want to. 
And as you grow in the Lord, anybody ever has become a parent and you're like, okay, I've got to be less selfish. Anybody parenting? Now, I hope if you're a parent and you're figuring that out. Not all parents figure that out. Hence, a lot of really broken kiddos. Broken families. This is part of the growing up in Jesus. Is he's worthy. So, um, if, if you have not trusted in Jesus, not if you have sat, I didn't ask, did you sit in a church for, and listen to sermons? Have you gone to church for a long time? You know, have you done ministry? I'm not even asking, have you been a good person or a nice person? The question is, have you recognized your sin and turned to Jesus Christ for his mercy? That there's only one place that you're going to receive the forgiveness you need. You'll never be as perfect as God wants you to be, not in this world. And we're going to get to that at the end, by the way, for a little more encouragement. But you have to turn to Jesus. You have to turn to him. You have to turn away from that sin and turn to Jesus Christ. It's his love, his mercy that saves you. Psalms 24, 1 through 10. You know, I ask, we ask, is Christ, I mean, this is, this is church 101 here, guys, okay? And I, I, everybody acts like you move on to something more graduated. I think you just stay at 101 until Jesus comes for you. Just keep trying to be good at 101, man. I'm, it's like, if there's a professor in the house, great, I'll sit down, but I'm thinking y'all are at 101. That's where you are at, right along with me. Is Christ my first and greatest pursuit? I mean, I have to, I have to, and the Holy Spirit helps me. I have to ask this at my heart because we wander. We get ensnared in sin really easily. We get encumbered by all kinds of things. And I have to come to this place again. Am I, am I worshiping? Am I a worshiper? Is Jesus the highest place? Does he have the highest place in my life? Can I wake up tomorrow and say, Lord, I know whatever you would ask, I'm gonna give it to you because you're worthy. I don't wanna hold anything back. This is where God wants us. This is where he's worthy. And if, if the answer is no, and I trust the Holy Spirit to work in people's hearts today, otherwise you wouldn't have me preach this, where is, where is repentance? And you might say, I've walked with God for a long time. Good, turn around and start coming into Jesus again with all your heart. That's the beauty of, of, of the grace and the mercy of God. It's given to us not to say, you can just go do what you want. It's given to us to say, if you stumbled, he's having you back. And if you stumble again, he's having you back. And if you stumbled again, he's having you back. But he's calling you higher. He's calling us closer. Psalms 24, 1 through 10. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood or, or given his soul to an idol and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. And then the Psalms just continues to say, here we are called to ascend to the place where God's presence and glory is, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. You know, it's interesting. Those gatekeepers have to open the gate. Here's the glory of God. And the Ark of the Covenant is coming up to Jerusalem, and God's glory and presence is being brought to Jerusalem. But they got to open the gates. We have to make the choice that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Like I like him on my side. I'd say I like to be on his side. We'll put that proper. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors. The king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Say law. So we talk about suffering, right? All right, so um, once I said to my brother-in-law, I've got a good idea. Let's go hiking. Um, and uh, we hiked up to Flapjack Lakes. Now, I just read the, the stats on this. It was years ago when I was younger, okay? And not smart, too, because I didn't bring a water filtration system. Instead, I packed enough water in my bag for three days. <laughs> and anybody that's laughing really hard knows something about hiking. 
Uh, flapjack Lakes, 15.8 miles, 3,877 feet elevation gain. <clears throat> that was a long hike. Yeah, just a little. I'm like, oh, just bring a little water. I have plenty for both of us. You know, the start of it's like, okay, no problem. But then it's like switchbacks, you know. And you're like trudging on. I'm like, I thought I was in my 20s. You know, I'm not anymore, but I thought I was. Man, I was tired. It was a good thing we stayed up there a couple nights because it took me time to recuperate, you know. <laughs> and as you drank more water, the light and the load lightened, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting because uh, who may ascend? This, this journey, this, this struggle, it's, it's, in this world, it's not easy. It's not easy. And it's cool. When I got up there, I'm sitting up there, and it's, it, you know, morning after my body's recuperated and we're getting ready to go back the last day. You know, I'm up, the sun's rising, and just up over the mountains, and there's this tra these tranquil lakes up there. We would had trout, you know, and fried them. I cooked them for them. And, uh, you know, it's just peaceful. And there was, there was, there was effort in getting there. But it was worth the journey. Or when I was hunting up in uh, Packwood, and, you know, not as much elevation gain, but you're carrying your hunting pack and your rifle, you know, and I get off the beaten path because I see there's, like, this body of water a little ways off, and I'm looking for elk. And as I go busting through brush off the trail and come around the corner and swing south, all of a sudden everything opens up, and I can see uh, Mount... Uh, I got to make sure I get the mountain right because I like my sermons to be accurate. Mount Adams down in Oregon... The sky opens up. It's just beautiful. I actually started weeping. You know, I just, I'm, I'm an emotional person, I guess, but just, just feeling the presence of God and the beauty and the journey was worth it. It was worth a little bit of struggle. And you know what is weird about sin and the things that hold us back? They're not as, they're not as good as we think they are. They really aren't. I mean, you find yourself all through your life when, when you come to God and say, God, give me grace to let go Give me grace to put my life away, and you do, and then you're filled up with more of the Holy Spirit, and you find yourself saying, why did I wait so long? What was so good? Hmm. I think it's interesting that God called Moses up on Mount Sinai proper, because he's going to get the law, and he was 80 plus years old. Let that, let that not be lost to you. I mean, he was at 120. It said he was still young. I mean, he maybe could have hiked better than me. But 80 plus years old, and God's come up the mountain where there's smoke and lightning and fire and everything, you know. And Moses doesn't say, but I'm 80 plus years old. He just goes up. And then he comes down, and he smashes the Ten Commandments, and then he goes back up again. I mean, and he was not upset at God. He's probably upset at Israel. They're like, hey, guys, I'm 80-plus years old. Now i got to go up again, okay? <laughs> hey, uh, I, this isn't part of the notes either, but maybe sometimes younger people in your life make you go up again. Yeah, maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes some of us say, man, I, you know, I've done my part. You know, I'm, I'm getting up there, and it's time for me to take a break, let those young people handle it. You know those young people are dumb. Did you guys know that? Okay, all the older people are saying yes. The younger people are shaking their heads like, yeah, I know. There's younger people. No, we're talking about you too. I mean, if, if, you're, if somebody's older than you and they walk, they know a little bit more than you. I'm just saying. I mean, yeah, old people still need to do things in the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Amen. Oh, man, the church needs the old people. They need them. And not just for their tithes. So here you got this journey, up we go, and it's, it's like a wrestle, it's a struggle, it's striving, and, it's, and it's, not, it's not works to make you right with God, but it is not an easy journey. If you're going to be in Christ and you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we're going to be the church God's called us to be, there's going to be a wrestling against sin, and you have to make the choice to repent. I can't make that choice for you. You have to make that choice as the Holy Spirit calls. But then the cool thing is Isaiah 35, 1 through 10, the wilderness and the desert will be glad and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted, strengthen the feeble, Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. So judgment is coming. 
But the pause is not for effect. It's because I lost my place. <laughs> the recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Yeah. yeah. Why? Because you're in Jesus. That's why. Then the eyes of the blind will be open. We're singing that song today. This is stuff we're seeing. The, the kingdom of God manifest presently because I knew as I was praising that the Lord is doing that presently, presently healing people, presently opening eyes spiritually, presently opening hearts so we can receive what he has for us. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. All those, all those people who have been so scared to open their mouth for Jesus. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arab. The scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. And the haunt of jackals, its resting place. Grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way. And fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there, and the ransom of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. So it's interesting because in this journey God has us on, we go from hiking up a mountain to a highway. And the highways, were there. it's called a highway because they actually would build it up high enough that there is nothing obstructing. It's just a straight road. Isn't that cool? Is it cool there's gonna be a day when Jesus comes for us and we're glorified with Jesus and it is a highway. The, seriously, I was asking my family today, when there's a new heaven and new earth, I think that we're gonna, I don't know if I asked, I made a statement, but I asked because I like to ask them just so they think about it too. But um, I think that we get there, we're gonna be changed and we're gonna be worshiping and we're gonna be working perfectly like I won't get into that. It's a whole other sermon. But I'm thinking that everywhere we are, we're just, we're just experiencing the full fellowship with God that we should and fellowship with each other in the Holy Spirit. But I think sometimes we actually gather together at the throne of God for special worship. Just wondering about that. Yeah. This, I mean, there's a reason why it says don't forsake the assembling together. Probably because there's special assemblies when we're in the new heavens and the new earth. But I'm looking forward to the day where there isn't the wrestle anymore. The day when, uh, I mean, think about this. I, we got my buddy, um, forgive me, remind me of your name again, Bobby, Bob. I'm going to call him Bob. This is more formal than behind the pulpit right now. <laughs> you fix, you fix uh, like parking lots and stuff, right? And you fix them because they get broken, right? Yeah, cool. So, would it be cool if there's a day, I mean, it wouldn't be cool because then you wouldn't have jobs, but would it be cool if there was a day where every work that you put your hands to never goes backwards anymore? Mm. Mm. It's coming. I, I mean, it's beyond my comprehension. How is that even possible? You, even if I do something right, one of you comes in and messes it up. <laughs> and if you do something right, I can guarantee I'm gonna come and mess it up, you know? <laughs> and the Lord's like, okay, give grace, lots of grace, lots of grace. James 4, 7 through 10, submit therefore to God, resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you, you double-minded. So this, I will say this, as I was driving to work and praying, I just realized, yeah, the blood of Jesus covers our sins. Yes, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But y'all understand there are, there's a place where the spirit of God calls us, says, come away, come away from this stuff and stay away from it and just come into me. You wanna know why? Cleansing, it takes time. It does. Y'all understand when we make our choices to step outside of what God wants, it affects us. It affects our spirit. It affects our soul. It affects our flesh. It affects us. And so there's, there's the blood of Jesus and we're in right relationship through faith. But I think the church needs to understand when everybody's like driving full speed ahead and just trying to, okay, fix me, God, moving on. I mean, when you make the choices to step outside of what God wants for you, then it's gonna take time, often, for, for proper healing to happen. What that looks like is the Lord says, stop. Stop stop your life. Just stop. I mean, go to work, do those things. But maybe not. Maybe the Holy Spirit says, you need to stop. And you need to, you need to meet with me 
and you need to let me do a work in you. Anybody ever felt the Spirit of God calling you to that? You're like, I gotta stop. I can't just keep going the way I am. But you know, our schedules are very important to the Lord. I think what God wants to do in us is most important to him. Because you know what? He has the wisdom to know what's best for us. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. This is an encouraging message from James, the elder. <laughs> Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. This is the suffering we're talking about. And it sounds terrible, but it's not. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. This is the end result like climbing the mountain. Where do we arrive? What do we see? What do we as the church get to experience? If we choose Christ, if we turn from sin. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on, anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him. That'd be good. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing the same experience of sufferings are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So there are people who are obedient and full of the Holy Spirit, and they are suffering because of their faith in Christ. So let's join in on that. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. So John Mark, I believe, is helping dictate this for Peter. Okay? And um, so it's really beautiful, I think, because karitizo. This is when my son sees me and he thinks I'm choking. Okay? Karitizo. To make someone completely adequate or sufficient for something. That's what Jesus is gonna do in you. Oterizo, oh sorry, sterizo. I'm not really, I'm not an expert on Greek, so hang in here with me, all right? And if I read it proper, it's almost, it's like poetic, okay? Sterizo, confirm to cause someone to become stronger in the sense of more firm and unchanging in attitude or belief. This is what Jesus Christ is gonna do in you if you just suffer for a little bit longer. To cause someone to be or to become more able or capable with the implication of a contrast with weakness. He's going to perfect, he's going to confirm, he's going to strengthen you. And demeliao, uh, de to provide a firm basis for belief or practice, to provide a basis for, to provide a foundation for, to cause to be steadfast in. And I look for the day that I will be steadfast in Jesus Christ. Strong enough for every work that he's called me to. Unwavering in faith. Or, or, or courage. This is what Jesus Christ is gonna do. Beloved, 1 John 3, 2 through 3, now we are children of God. It has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So, just so that we're clear on this, not a message of works, but following Jesus, there is work involved. It's called responding to the Holy Spirit. And I don't know why the Lord sends me here today to tell people to stop sinning. I mean, he's telling me to do that. So I'll share with you what he's saying to me. Stop sinning. And the reason he's saying that, turn from your sin, is because he wants to call us higher. And if we turn our, our hearts and our thoughts and our actions away from the things of this world, then we'd be able to put our effort towards pursuing Christ. And God's going to, going to accomplish these things in us. So here's the deal. I want you to understand in the wrestling, there'll be, there'll be no end to the struggle against sin in this world, in us. 
I hope that this helps somebody understand because it can become very frustrating, especially to people who won't dig in the Word of God and try to understand. There is a wrestling till Jesus comes back for us. And we're actually called to it, to be willing to struggle, to wrestle. But the thing is, God wants us to see the hope. He wants us to understand what is the end result of that. I mean, look at how buff Chris is. It's because the man, I think he goes to the gym, maybe not. Maybe that's why he's not so buff. He's not a really good example in this, in this analogy. I'm sorry. I had to, my brother, I had to pick on him a little bit. Um, but oh, so, so my 18-year-old son, he bought some, you know, some uh, Bowflex weights. You know, you can click them over and make them big and, and everything. And he's got a six-pack and stuff. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> but it did. Weird genetics. But at any rate... I mean, he's like, you know, he's lifting, he's, he's and he, yeah, he, and we laugh because when he gets to a mirror, he's like, all the time. <laughs> I can do that because he's not here today. So, at any rate, um, I don't know what the purpose of that meth. I don't know what the purpose of that was. The basis for our righteousness. The basis for our righteousness. This is what we have to understand. We're we're willing. We're willing to suffer and all kinds of different things to have all kinds of things that God never intended for us to have as the most important things in our life. But how about as a church, we'd be willing to suffer more for Christ so we can have him and he can have us more fully. And in that wrestling, if you, if you are a person who's struggling with sin, you say, I have trusted in Jesus, but I find myself wrestling, struggling. Let me tell you something, you're normal. The devil likes to come and tell you you're not. He likes to tell you you're the only one, you're messed up, you're not good enough. Let me tell you, let me tell you something. Your righteousness comes through Jesus Christ. This is why I'm, when we're worshiping, I'm in awe of the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God. I do not deserve to be here. I do not deserve the honor of bringing God's word. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all of my sin. I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. God has made me in his eyes holy as he is through Jesus Christ. And that is where I will stand till the day he comes and actually makes me what he knows I am, and what I am not in, in practice fully. Amen. Yeah, the wrestling happens. But understand that. If you're struggling, you're wrestling with sin, that's normal. Struggle. Wrestle against it. Suffer a little bit. Suffer with me. This is a sermon encouraging you to come and suffer with me. How many are all glad you came to church today? <laughs> Always keeping in mind the end result, the hope. All right. Well, Father, in Jesus' name, you know. You know every person here, everything in each person's heart, mind, the struggles, the wrestling, people that are living under constant guilt, condemnation, not walking in the freedom that they should have because they've forgotten as they've struggled. They've forgotten who you are and what you've done for them. And I thank you, Father, for freedom because you would speak love and mercy and grace. But I also pray, Lord, there would be grace and strength from you for us to go higher, and not just one of us, Lord, as your church together. A willingness, I pray that you would reveal your son to us. Lord, your Holy Spirit would cause us to see your glory, cause us to see the beauty of your holiness, and we would see more than ever before how worthy you are of us giving our lives, no matter what it costs, that we would actually find joy in that suffering. Because, Lord, we'd have a clear vision of the hope that you have for us, the hope of your calling. I mean, your word said it, and, I, and I, I forgot to emphasize it when I was reading my notes, but it said it right here. You called us to your eternal glory in Christ. Thank you. So I pray, Father, you just bless, strengthen, confirm, establish your people as we would put ourselves more into your hands and entrust our hearts and lives to you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. I believe the word is clear today and nowhere in the story of God is his word a word of rejection, but of correction. His heart is to correct us in the ways that we walk. And maybe that's you today, and you don't know where you stand with him, and you need to correct the, your thinking and the direction that you're going. It may be in the simple and the small things. It may be in your relationships that you have with others. It may be in the time that you don't spend with him that you need to. 
But may we be a people of God, growing in God, willing to suffer for God because of what he has done for us. What an example. Would you stand with me? It is my heart that we grow in our discipleship, that we do not have a veneer of discipleship, that we just do what looks like Christ-like or Christianity has taught us, but that we actually have a transformative depth to us because we have allowed the exchange of the godliness that he has given to each and every one of us as a gift to settle deep within us. That takes work. That takes slowing down. And I think that's what I heard today. And to some, I think the word was so clear, some of us might have to climb that mountain again for our children, for our past generation. And we might have to go back to the beginnings again. But we have hope in Christ that he is faithful to complete the work that he began. Amen? Amen. 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 Before we say our Father's prayer, uh, Michael Johnson had shared with me uh, a wonderful book, and I've been reading on it because we do. We're going to get some more insight on the, the Father's prayer that we were taught by Christ. But may his kingdom be blessed. We don't have a rogue king sovereignly waiting in, at his throne to be returned to him what is already his. Satan has not taken this world from him. Mankind has not lost it from him. May his kingdom be blessed. May we bow our knee to him. May we be obedient to him in all that we do as we share in this prayer today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'm so excited about what God is doing. Do not leave if you have a need in your heart. Let us pray with you. I've been cleaning out the room over here so that after services and before, you can prepare your heart. We'll have the prophetic journal in there. We'll have a station for communion to start in our services and or end the service when you need to take it. And then every month as a body together, we will at the first of the month next week take communion together. And so we love to be a body together, a family together, working out the things that God has for us together. Amen. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you for being here. God bless you.